Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. My name is Alex and in this video series we're going to explore GraphQL. So GraphQL is probably something you've heard about. It's a project launched by Facebook in 2012 and it's been gaining a lot of popularity recently. So what is GraphQL? Well, in essence, GraphQL is first of all a query language for your APIs, but it's also a server-side runtime for executing those queries. Now, GraphQL is not really a storage engine or a database engine. It's just simply an abstraction layer on top of the existing API that allows you to query your existing data with the existing code base. So imagine that you have some kind of a database and you have projects in that application or database. So in GraphQL, you would basically define a type, you would call it a project, then you define the set of fields that that type will have. So for example, name, which would be a string, a tagline, contributors as an array of users. And then when you issue queries to your GraphQL web service, your queries would basically be a set of curly braces where you have a type, in this case a project. It might also have arguments like name, for example, GraphQL. And they also list the set of fields that you'd like to request from that service or basically web application, right? And as a response, you're going to get a JSON object that contains a key. So project, this is exactly the type that you requested and also the list of fields that you asked for. So the advantage of GraphQL is it actually allows you to ask for specific fields in your web service and receive those fields back as a JSON response. Now, as it turns out, this is actually very useful for RESTful APIs because one of the inherent problems with RESTful APIs is either underfetching of data or overfetching of data. And we're going to explore that in detail. But essentially, even if you look at this simple example over here, they have a query with a hero and they ask for specific fields on that type, on that hero type. So you could ask for a name. If you add more fields, let's say height, then that field is also going to be included in the response. And like I said, this is pretty useful for RESTful APIs. And it's also very useful for different kinds of clients. So for example, your API might have a web client, might have mobile apps that also interact with that API. Well, it's kind of useful for those APIs because with GraphQL, you could specify the exact information that you want to fetch. Now, some of the other advantages of GraphQL is that it has a type system. So what happens is you don't necessarily have to build your application from scratch. So what that means is you could actually introduce GraphQL to an existing application. You're just basically going to define a type system that contains the types and the types, like I said, basically represent a different object in your application. And then you have a single endpoint, which is typically slash GraphQL, where you basically send all of your queries or requests. And as you can see here in the example, we can have different types that have different fields. And of course, they could also be nested. So for example, a hero type, might have friends. The friends could be another type that's nested in the hero. And then friends might have other fields that could also be composite fields or other types. One of the other cool things about GraphQL is its IDE, which is known as graphical. So what graphical allows you to do is to basically issue queries inside of a web page and then get immediate results from your web server. And apart from that, some of the other advantages is that with GraphQL, we have simplified versioning of our APIs. And like I said, we don't necessarily have to rebuild the whole application in order to introduce GraphQL. What we could do is to just simply import GraphQL and then have a few type definitions, set up an endpoint pointing to GraphQL service. And then we're basically going to have a functional running GraphQL server. And then we can basically start building on top of it. And of course, there's quite a few companies who already use GraphQL. One of them is obviously Facebook. You might have heard of GitHub, GraphQL API. And there's quite a few other big players on the scene who actually use GraphQL. So what we're going to do throughout this series is we're going to build a simple chat application to explore GraphQL. And we're actually going to begin from the very scratch with the very basics of GraphQL. And as we move along, I'm going to introduce you to different tools like Apollo Server or Apollo Client. We're going to also explore GraphQL Yoga and some of the other tools as well. But like I said, we're going to begin with the bare basics just to understand how GraphQL actually works. So what I'm going to do next is I'm going to switch to my terminal and in my directory, I'm going to create a new project. So let's make a new directory. I'm going to call it chat and navigate in that directory. What I'm going to do next is I'm going to initialize a new project. So I'll do yarn in it dash y and the dash y flag is basically going to answer all of the questions with a yes and then i'll open it in visual studio code so what i'm going to do next is i'll open i'll go back to the terminal and let's also open up a new file i'll call it index.js right so let's get started so if i go back to the browser there's actually quite a few links on the website so if you go to code at the top you're going to see that GraphQL actually comes with quite a few SDKs. 
or different implementations for different languages. So for example, you have C Sharp, Go, Java, and there's one actually for JavaScript. So if you click on that one, you're gonna be navigated to this section where you're gonna see some information about the GraphQL JS library. So if we switch to that one, here's the information about the GraphQL JS. So all we have to do is to basically just install GraphQL. So let's go back to the terminal. So what I'll do is I'll do yarn add GraphQL. So this is going to install the GraphQL dependency. Now back in our code editor, let's do the following. Let's import GraphQL as well as build schema. And this is gonna come from GraphQL like that. What we can do next is to call the GraphQL function. And the GraphQL function expects at least three parameters. We're gonna need to have a schema. We're gonna need to have a query. And we're also gonna have what's known as a root value. So what this function allows us to do is to first of all have a schema. We're gonna begin with the schema first. Let's have a schema. I'm gonna create a new constant schema. And we're gonna call the build schema helper. What this allows us to do is to have a schema definition. And as you can see here, I'm using backticks. It's basically just a string. So what it requires us to include is first of all a query type. So we already kind of talked about the types in GraphQL. GraphQL is built with the type system at the heart. So the types are the definitions for different kinds of objects or entities in the application. So the root type is known as the query and that's the main type that you always have to include. So for example, in the query, we can have a message, right? A message could be a string or something like that. Once we have that query, we're basically telling GraphQL that there is a message property or a field that we can query. And when we query that field, we're gonna get back a string. Now, of course, in order to actually return something for that message, we're gonna have to have a resolver function. So what I'll do next is I'll create a new constant. I'll call it root value. And this one would need to be an object that contains a key that will correspond to the message. So in this case, we have a definition for a message. That's why we have to use the same exact key. We can provide a function and then that function can return something. So in this case, we could return a string. We could just simply say GraphQL works, something like that, right? So finally, in order to actually execute that query, we're gonna pass that in. So this would be the actual GraphQL query that we need to execute. So the format for queries is pretty standard. There is a set of curly braces like that. And then inside you could basically specify the types or, uh, or fields that you want to execute. So in this case, we only have one type, it's a message and it's a string. So we can leave it off like that. And then at the end, this GraphQL function is just basically gonna give us a promise. So we can chain it with a then, we can have a response, we could console log that response. But in this case, because we're simply doing a console log, the other thing we could do is just to simply pass the console log reference itself. And this is basically going to involve the console log function with the only argument. And then finally, we could also catch it. And I'm gonna pass a reference to console error, okay? I'm gonna save that. And back in the terminal, what we could do here is we can run node on the index.js file. And as you can see here, we get back a response, which essentially is a JSON object that contains an important data key property. All of the responses on the cores that you run in GraphQL are actually going to have this data property. And then as an object, as a value for that data property, we get an actual object, which contains the message key. And the message key contains the string that we actually define in GraphQL. Now, it's probably not very useful to just have a simple string on the schema. So it might be interesting to create something more complicated. So for example, let's actually have a custom type. So for example, if we're building a chat application, every chat application will probably have users in the database, right? So what we could do is we could have a, a query on users, let's say, and that type or that query will actually correspond to the user type. So it's something that we'll actually have to create. So we'll have to create a user type now, the user type will probably have an ID, it'll probably have an email, and it'll probably have, let's say, a name, maybe an avatar URL or something like that. Now, when you have those fields, when you basically list those fields, you also have to define 
the actual type of those fields. So in this case, we could actually use the standard types in GraphQL, which are string, integer, float, or boolean, also known as scalars. So in this case, the ID could actually be a special ID type, which essentially behaves like a string. The difference is the ID is specifically designed for unique identifiers. And then the exclamation mark says that every user type must have an ID which pretty much makes sense. If you have a database of users, every user needs to be uniquely identified by an ID. So that exclamation mark basically says whenever we return a user, it must have an ID. Then the email, well, that makes sense to be a string, right? The name, same thing, we could make it a string. And then the email is probably something that we're gonna have to require all the time. So I'm also gonna add an exclamation mark. And then the avatar URL could just simply be a string, right? So we have a definition for a user. Now, of course, as you probably know, we're going to have to create a resolver function for that user. So let's say we have users and this is going to be a function again. So we're going to have to return something. Now, what I'm going to do in this case, I'm actually going to create a fake database. So let's have a simple constant database, which has a collection of users. And this would be an array which contains a bunch of objects. So for example, the first one could have an ID of one. We could have an email of alex at gmail.com. We could also have a name, let's say Alex. We could also create a few more. So for example, I'll create a second one. Let's say it's gonna be max at gmail.com. And I finally have to switch the name. So let's add max. So that's pretty much it. So now we have two user objects. And then finally here, what we could do is we can access the database object and then the user's collection. So that's basically going to return the array of all users. So for our query, what we could do here is instead of message, we can now reference users. And then finally, we cannot leave it off like that because users is actually a type. So it's not a string, it's not a Boolean or a float or something like that. It's actually a composite type. So we also have to list the fields that we actually want to fetch for that type. So in this case, let's say I'm interested in the email for each user. So we're essentially expecting to get an array of users and we're expecting to see the email property or field on every user instance. So when we return database users, we actually expect to get an array that contains users inside of it. So or individual user objects, essentially. And in this case, we actually have to change users, not to the user type, but to actually an array of users because we're expecting a list and not the individual type. So what I'll do is I'll add square brackets and this basically indicates a list. And then finally, I'm also gonna add an exclamation point, meaning that I don't want to have any null object inside of that array. So the exclamation, once again, means that the value cannot be null. And I'm also gonna say the same thing for the array itself. So what this means, the first exclamation mark over here outside of the list, means that the list itself cannot be a null or a null reference. This has to be at least an empty array or an array with objects. And then the second one inside, the second exclamation point, means that the object itself cannot be null. So the user inside of the array has to be an actual object and not null. So I'm gonna save this. And then back in the terminal, I'm gonna do node index.js. And as you can see here, we get a bunch of objects. Now we can't actually inspect those objects. We can't see the inner properties of those objects. So what I'm gonna do instead is I'll come back to this then clause. What I'll do instead is I'll actually pass a callback function and then I'll do console dir and then I'll pass the response but I'm also gonna pass an option here. I'm gonna say that the depth is gonna be null. So this is actually going to print out the object as is. So I'm gonna rerun this and we're actually gonna see the inner properties of those objects. And as you can see here, the interesting thing is we don't actually get all of the properties on the user. So what I mean by that is that in our fake database, we have objects that have a bunch of fields, right? We have an ID, we have an email, we also have a name. So each object sort of follows that convention. But in this case, for the query, we're only interested in the email property. So for some reason, we may not necessarily need the ID we may not necessarily need other properties, like let's say we add messages or we add more types. If we complicate the database structure, we only want to know the email. And if you want to know about other fields as well, you could add, let's say the ID. So if I rerun the query again, or the, um, the application here, as you're gonna see, we get the array that contains the objects and each object is gonna have the ID as well as the email. So like I said, you ask for specific fields and you get those exact fields back in response or in return. Now it's probably not the case that you're gonna be running terminal applications that often. So if I go back to the browser, we actually have different options. 
for our GraphQL applications. So what you've seen so far is just a simple application that uses the GraphQL library. And that library basically just uses a CLI. So what we did here is we basically created a simple schema, right? We created a schema with the type of query, with the type of user, and then we have a user's query on it. And then we also have a root resolver function, which basically returns you the list of users. And then we simply issue a query with users. Now, in order to make this more flexible, in order to make this an actual application that you can interact with, we're going to have to use another library. 